you will turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Our sister read from chapter 12. And all of this is in the context of this, these elements, the sacrament. And for the next few weeks, we're going to, Lord willing, be together. And I would like to actually speak on a theme, uh, I think a truth, uh, for those three weeks that I, I will be sharing with you on these evenings is being the church versus going to church. And I think that's what Jesus was talking to her about. <laughs> Where do I go, right? And I think we spend a lot of time going to church, but are we existing as the church? So we come to church, and we're going to partake of these elements. So we go to church to do this, but are we being the church that these elements are speaking to? And all that goes with the context that surrounds why we do this. And what is this that we are doing? You know, when I was a kid, this never made any sense to me. <laughs> it was always very boring. What is this? You know, uh, the juice was good. You know, it tasted pretty good. You know, the crackers, they, were, they had a lot to be desired. But, you know, or whatever. The, they're always dry. Always kind of <laughs> sucks the moisture out of your mouth, right? And that little juice, ah, that's refreshing. But that's what it was to me. I, it took me years to figure out, what is this? Why are we doing this? It seems so rote, right? Kind of people patterns, which is what the church does. But what if it's you know, signifying what the church is? And you know, where our sister read is in the context of where Paul's talking about this. And you got to remember, originally there weren't chapters and verses. So there was no like real break there. It was a letter. And in the Corinthians, you have to understand something about the letter to the Corinthians. It's the whole letter is a rebuke. Okay, he's rebuking them. And there's a reason why. And then he brings this in amidst it to help them, in a sense, shame them. What they are, what we can defile as the church. Okay? And it all hinges on the passage that our sister read is one body. That it exists in such a way and God de designed the body in such a way that there would be no divisions in the body. But all would be caring for each other on an equal basis, you know, exalting one another higher than ourselves on a constant, existent basis to where no divisions would exist. I grew up amidst a church that is nothing but division. Have you noticed? The church. Well, let's look at this, because as we come to this, there's a real warning in this. And every time we do this, and we've been with you when you have done this, and we've been done this together, there's always that little word of that warning, you can do this unworthily. What is that? What does he mean? Um, that's what I want to talk about. Being the church versus going to church. Okay? Well, I wanted to read this. Uh, uh, Johnny Erickson Tata. You've heard of Johnny? She, <laughs> Shannon read this today. It was a little, it's a little devotional thing. And it's on whenever you eat the bread. And she got this little, little paragraph that I thought, wow, that is, that is so good. So I wanted to read it. Communion celebrates the body of Christ broken on the cross. Communion celebrates the body of Christ, the church. Communion is a celebration of unity. She got it. 
huh. So we could say communion is a celebration of being the church the way God designed her to be. Because it recognizes what Christ did when he gave his body and shed his blood. So let's look at it. If we go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And I'm going to read the familiar text. Uh, I have to take off my glasses to read. Verse 23, chapter 11, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23 through 26. And I want to start there, and then I'm going to kind of jump around a little bit to kind of get in the context of what's going on. Um, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Now, we have to understand, when they were doing this, it was a meal. When Jesus did this, it was a Passover meal. And in that meal, there's a lot of elements that are all symbol of Christ, his suffering, the bitter herb, and so on and so forth. And then that last cup at the end is what he's talking about. Okay? It's, it's all elements in a Passover meal and that's what he's talking about is when the, in that meal, that's what he was doing. And he was using that meal to show them this, what it meant and how he was to suffer and what it would mean. He was trying to prepare them for it, which, of course, Peter, he couldn't believe it would happen. Remember? Because <laughs> we see things and we perceive things as Isaac was saying. And we're just our thoughts are not his his ways are not ours um and sometimes it confuses us and makes us uh uncomfortable that's a good one uncomfortable god likes to keep us uncomfortable (laughs) keep us shaking a little bit but here's something in this Do you realize as we take this, it says you are proclaiming. That's very interesting. You are proclaiming his death until he returns. So there's a proclamation in this. It's not just taking of a sacrament and partaking of a sacrament. There's actually a proclamation that is going on as we come together and share this together, there's something that the Spirit is doing and proclaiming to the world. A testimony. A truth. And it's proclaiming his death. What does that mean? We're just saying over and over, he died, he died, he died. You know, when I was a child, I asked those questions. Okay, I just, what do you mean? We proclaim his death. I just say, okay, he died. Okay, he died. Okay, he died. Okay, yeah, he died. Yeah, he died. I say it every once a month, right? He died. He died, right? That's it? I think there's a really good passage in Romans that helps us understand what is it we are proclaiming. And I heard some prayers tonight, some song, that, yeah, we're proclaiming this. And when we partake of this, I have to make myself zero in and proclaim even to my own soul, my own mind, because it becomes rote, you guys. It becomes pattern. It becomes habitual and then numb. And it means very little. And you have a lot of children in your congregation. And you know, like I said, when I was a child, what? You know, we have a lot of children in the congregation in Mariposa. 
And I work for them to understand, too. And I'll sit with them, and I know you do, too, to help them understand. Let's go to Romans chapter 5. In this, as we share these elements, we're proclaiming something. We're proclaiming the death of Christ. But what all does that entail? I love this passage. Romans 5, verse 1. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more now that we are reconciled shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Now there's another passage where Paul says, I am an ambassador of reconciliation. You know that passage? That's something that we're proclaiming. Reconciliation. And amidst that proclamation, when Jesus died and shed his blood, gave his body, he reconciled us back to the Father in the right relationship. And we come to it through faith by grace. That's what he's talking about. A tremendous, amazing work of Lord. While we were still enemies, while we were weak, while we were sinning. <laughs> I mean, it all took place even before I was even thought of, born. But in his plan, this proclamation was made for me to be able to proclaim with you, with me, with us, to the world through doing this. That's amazing to me. But that's why the warning. Because if it was all done for reconciliation and the body was designed as one with no divisions, what is a division between a relationship? What is it? Okay. In a relationship, if two divide, separate, what is that? Divorce. Yeah. What's another word? They become unreconciled. Ah. That's the warning. Do you understand? Okay. He, we are proclaiming reconciliation. That's what we're proclaiming. So if we come together and I have something against my brother or sister or I have an unreconciled relationship and I partake of this, I'm mocking what Jesus did. Do you understand? This is what the church in Corinth was doing. Ah. That's why he follows up when he starts talking about these elements and all that Christ, what he learned, he follows it up with the body and its makeup. Because he started the letter on another note. <laughs> so let's go to the 
context just before verse 23 and 11. Just go up a few verses to verse 17. And let's listen to uh, Paul's little bit intensity here. But in the following instructions, <coughs> I do not commend you, because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. Ouch. Uh, you know, when I come, and I want to speak, I want to share, you know, I've, I've spoken different places all over the world, you know, when I come and I want to speak, I don't want to come and say, you know what, I'm not commending you at all. <laughs> you're doing horrible. You're just, I mean, you're terrible in what you are doing. And there's no way I can come in this. There's no way I can support this. Oh, that's heavy. This is the context that we drop into. Are we catching what's going on here? Okay. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are... What? What? So, what's another word for that? Unreconciliation. unreconciliation amidst you. There's divorce amidst you. There's unreconciled relationships amidst you. Ooh. I don't know of a congregation where there's not. I don't know of a church where they, you know, we don't. Do you understand? This is a reality of the church life is, wow, we make mistakes i've been in ministry a long time and you know i made a lot of mistakes that have caused others to leave not meaning to i mean that's just it's what we do do you understand our best and what we're trying to do is you know work for people's salvation for their maturity but sometimes we're too intense we're too forward we're sometimes too aggressive and we don't give god time and it scares people away chases people do you understand it happens. But then there's those who they just don't want to be reconciled. What are these divisions he's talking about? Let's look at it here. I hear that there are divisions among you, and I believe it in part. But go to chapter 1. He starts off this whole letter on this rebuke. And so chapters 1 through 4 are the introduction to the letters, actually there were three letters he wrote to the church in Corinth, we have two of them. But this first four chapters are the introduction to really the rest of what he was going to be speaking to them about, and it's pretty heavy. It's pretty, pretty heavy. It's, he's rebuking a lot, but he starts off with in verse 10. I'm going to start there in chapter 1. I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. What I mean is that each one of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas. Or, I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Notice he's a little bit offended because his name is being thrown in the mix. Oh yeah, we, we're, we're Paul followers. You know, have you, you kind of apply that to modern? What does that look like today? Let's apply it, right? We've got to apply the scriptures. Okay, what does it mean for today? What, how does that apply to today? And I'm going to tell you, I addressed this in Bible college, and I addressed it in seminary. And in both in Bible college and in seminary, they said to me, Mark, you're always bringing up the questions nobody wants to deal with. <laughs> and I said, you can't not deal with it. It's in the word of God. Like you're going to escape something? Like we're going to get away with something? This has been a burden for me. Okay? Many years. And I tremble doing this. Because 
There's a proclamation here. And it means something to our Lord. And we need to get in tune with him what it means. And more how we are to be. These people were having some issues. Today, what does it look like? Ah, thank you. Very good. But don't expect to make friends. And I'm not joking. This is a hard pill to swallow. <laughs> I, I'm a Presbyterian. Well, I'm a Baptist. Well, I, you know, I'm, I'm a loose friend. Well, you know, I, right? I, I follow Calvin. Huh? Does that sound the same to you? What? Did, the Luther, did Luther die for you? You know, were you baptized in the name of Calvin? Right? We could go on. I mean, just in the Baptist, and I know that's kind of your guys' background, right? So I can kind of yank on that. <laughs> okay, right? Mine is um, evangelical free. Okay, that was what I was licensed in and sent out was evangelical free denomination okay so but you know right how many baptist denominations are there you know there's hundreds literally and you know you can go down a street in a city or a town and you can see maybe five or six different baptists reformed baptist first baptist second baptist can you it's just like what are you competing or something we were here second. You know, I don't know. I don't know what all that's about. But I do know this. God isn't pleased. That I know. What do we do with this? Divisions are real. They're real. Unreconciliation is real and it's serious amidst God's people we need to be honest here we need to be true that's what he's saying when you come you have to be true now he's not forbidding taking it even amidst the divisions but he is demanding when you do, you're acknowledging the facts. You're calling a spade a spade. That's kind of the way we say it in America. You call a spade a spade, right? You don't call it a heart, you know, deck of cards, right? You don't call it a club. A spade is a spade. Ace of spades. That's the one you want. <laughs> okay? Realities. Okay, and games we play. Ah. This is serious. Romans 5 is so beautiful. What he has done for us. Paul is like, you guys, you're fooling with something here. I don't think you understand. And he says something at the very end of the introduction that the kingdom of God is not made up of words, but of power. That's a big truth. The kingdom of God is not made up of words, but of power. And the power of the cross to reconcile the world for all who would believe and come in a right relationship with God and then to reconcile our relationship to where man with man, man with woman, do you understand? It be right, honorable, true. That's power. That's really frightening power and we're too loosey goosey with it do you understand that's what Paul was saying 
you're fooling around here with some things. You don't understand what you're even saying. Oh, I'm this. I'm this. Oh, I follow this one. Well, I follow this one. Well, you know, people have always said, you know, your congregation. I said, I don't got a congregation. At least I hope not. <laughs> but you can't help what other people do. Do you understand? But you, me, inside, you got to know. And you got to be. Because I'm going to tell you, God doesn't see the divisions. It doesn't matter if they're there. It isn't. Do you understand? It's vanity. It's emptiness. It's smoke. It isn't there. But it gives that appearance, doesn't it? But the reality isn't that there's the divisions of the denominations. It's the unreconciled people. That's the reality. The broken relationships, the divisions in the one body. Now you got to get the picture. It was red. The body's just an ear. Look at that body. Got it? That's, this is it. This is me. Just the ear. How corny would that be? How about, okay, just the nose. It's just the nose. This, this, there's the body. Got it? That's it. That's all you get. And then all you can do is hear something. All you can do is smell something. That's it. Oh, boy. He didn't make the body like that. Very interesting. When he starts the letter... The metaphors are house, temple. When he starts to get towards the end of the first letter, the body. He changes the metaphors. Because he's bringing in all the old covenant pictures that God symbolized what he was going to do. Temple, right? Tabernacle, right? The tent, the house of God. But then in the New Covenant, one body, Jews and Gentiles, right? Slave, free, employer, employee, right? We can uh, apply it to today. It's all, you see, one, 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 one. How many times does it say one? You, know, you ought to count it. One spirit, one body, one spirit, one body, one spirit, one body, one spirit, one body, one body, one body, so that there be one body, one body, one body, no divisions, no divisions, one body. You agree on everything, same judgment. How hard is that? Husband and wife, how hard is that? Just on maybe dinner? Maybe raising the child? Right? I mean, wow, guys. Huh. Realities. That's what he wants. What is the reality? When you come to this table and you partake of these elements, what is the reality of the state of That's where he goes. Back to chapter 11. That's where he goes. We've read 23 through 26, and we see the proclamation that when we partake of this cup, it's a proclamation of what Jesus did on the cross and how he reconciled. And that reconciliation goes clear unto the church, the body. And the individual members in that body, which are attached to the body. So the arm says, okay, I want to detach. So I detach and I say, ah, oh, I'm not part of the body no more. Well, whoop de doo how much are you going to be able to do? You know, it's amazing to me that the brain tells every, you know, that's signaling. Do you know the brain even signals your, I mean, you guys are a lot more educated than me and smarter in a lot of ways probably, but maybe you know all this. But the brain, even when you start chewing, the brain starts telling you, oh, food's coming. And tells your stomach, okay, release those you know, uh, 
acids and that bacteria that's going to start digesting that food. So, you know, they have this thing now, you know, people eat these super juices, you know, these, uh, which are good. I mean, they're not bad. I mean, just, you know, those, what do they call those? Smoothies. smoothies, smoothies, smoothies. You know, those smoothies, you drink smoothies. You know, now they're learning, you know, you're, t eat, you're taking so much food, but you're drinking it. You're not chewing. The brain's not telling your gut, oh, there's food coming in, but you're drinking super food, right? And so a lot of people are having gut problems. <laughs> Gut problems because of the smoothies. So now they're saying, okay, okay, eat crackers with it or eat bread or you know something to where your brain starts going, oh, oh, okay, wake it up. Oh, thank you. I'm gonna eat now. Boom. Who's the head of the body? Jesus. So I'm an arm. I'm gonna detach. What does that say for that arm? Huh. Apply it. Hmm. Very interesting for the church. Because how can the arm and the leg separate and say, well, you know, Jesus is head. It's kind of a weird body. Head's over there, legs over there, arms over there. Now we know there's got to be local churches. I'm not talking about that reality. I'm talking about what we stand on. Our doctrine and how it divides. That's why Paul says to this church, I came boasting of one thing and preaching to you one thing, Christ and him crucified. That's it. No more. <sighs> Takes a long time in ministry to learn that. You know, there's a truth that knowledge builds pride. It doesn't say might. It doesn't say if. It says, knowledge builds pride. We have to be careful with that knowledge. Remember, there's knowledge. And the knowledge of God is a gift. Not to be used against one another. And in battle and war against each other. You know, it's been to that degree, literal war. You know, Europe, you had the Catholic provinces, you had the Protestant provinces. And they each built up their army. And they, <laughs> and you know, the reformers drowned the Baptists, the, you know, the, you know, to rebaptize the Anabaptists, baptize again. Yeah, they drowned them in the lake. Oh, you want to be baptized again? This is real church history. Wow. <sighs> And you know, all doing this, both sides, doing this. <sighs> Makes you want to cry. It's not why Christ died. Christ died to reconcile us. Wow. Wow. Verse 27 of chapter 11. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. You know, that's a curse. You, you realize what he's doing there? That's a curse. If you do this unworthily, you're eating and drinking a curse. You, you understand? It's a curse upon you. Let a person examine him or herself then, and so eat the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on him or herself. What's the body there?
does he mean by the body? Does not discern the body. What's the body? It's the church. church, church. That's why chapter 12. Which, remember, there was no chapter 12. He just kept going in the letter. And he walks right into, and look at verse 12 of chapter 12. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body. Jews are Greek, slaves are free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. I asked a pastor once of a denomination when he was boasting of their denomination being basically he was basically saying they are the real church the true church nothing but the church I looked at him and I says how many brides does Christ have <laughs> he looked at me and he said one I says yeah just one how many bodies Christ have it's one okay it doesn't matter do you understand it doesn't matter God doesn't see that but when you come to this table you have to be acknowledging the discernment of the body and then he'll accept it. Do you understand? Now when we partake of this together like this, there's others out there that may not want to with us. Do you, do you understand? That's a reality. And they partake. And in some because I'm not of their stripe, right? I come in, I won't be able to partake with them because I'm not, even though I profess Romans 5 <laughs> and we are reconciled to our Lord because I'm not of their denomination, they won't let me partake unless I get baptized in that denomination. Do you know that? these are real this is all Paul saying guys when you come together this is what I gave to you the Lord Jesus gave his body and his blood for the body to make one body to reconcile all and it doesn't matter no more in the New Covenant, Jew, Gentile, rich, poor, slave, owner. It doesn't matter. We're all one. And he designed the body in such a way that it would, in a sense, build itself up, edify itself. Do you understand? And that there be no divisions. Then how do I answer all this? We're not coming here and being honest. And so the Spirit doesn't even open our eyes to what we're doing. So, I'm blessed. I mean, here I am, American, born in this land. You I don't know where all you are, were born, but I think probably most of you were born in India, right? From another land. And Christ reached you, maybe in school here, I don't know. Maybe there, maybe you raised in a home where they were faithful, but somehow God reached, Christ reached them, right? And here, clear over here, the years of my family, you know, in the faith, and individuals, not all, but individuals in that faith, 
and how God reached out and brought us together and to where over the years and through our life born and then God joins us through student ministry. And then now look, here we are as one. But you know, there's those cultural things that can kind of hinder that too. And, you know, we can offend each other without even knowing it. Because, you know, <laughs> I don't want to do that. So a lot of times when I'm coming, I'm like, okay, I don't know how I should speak. Because I speak to the American church, you know, I don't know. But over the years, God has allowed me to speak to many churches in different lands. And you know what? Go into a nation and speak to all the denominations. And you know, I share these things with them. Because, folks, we're called to love one another. And you know, if he told us to love one another, it means we're going to struggle with loving one, one another. And Paul is showing these guys, look guys, you're playing a religious game here. You're doing this sacrament without thought, without discernment. And you know, you keep this up, it can turn as a curse upon you. Because you're mocking what Christ did on the cross. You're not proclaiming it anymore. Do you understand? So as we come together, we want to be discerning the body accurately, correctly, so that we're not eating and drinking judgment on ourselves. That is why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. If we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. Okay, where have I caused division? See, if I judge myself true, then I won't be judged. But there's an encouraging thing here. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. Okay. <sighs> so God does judge us. Isaac's word with the woman at the well. He does confront her life, her lifestyle, her whole philosophy, do you understand? And challenges, and judges, critiques. But works for her soul. So as we come together, you know, this is my first time being kind of with you up here, going to share this together. I want us to come, you know, we need to acknowledge, you know, Lord, I don't know. I'm not going to be able to fix it. I'm not saying that. And like I said, he's not forbidding taking of this. He's just saying when you do, just acknowledge to me the real and present state of my body, the church. What condition is she in? Is she healthy? Is she one? Am I working for reconciliation? And working in such a way that I'm caring for you? That's what he's saying. To take it in an unworthy manner is to do it flippant. No thought, no discerning, no acknowledgement of the state of affairs for his church. The reality of her condition. Now I'm going to tell you, people don't like this word. Okay? But take it to heart. This church needed to repent. <laughs> you know, this 
there's a, a community. Now remember, there's several churches in Corinth. Okay, big city. But there were divisions. You understand? Kind of um, like my football team. You know, my baseball team. No. In the church, there's none of that. You understand? It's us. We have to be reconciled. And then we have to be in the ministry of reconciliation. And then we will be the church. And no longer going to church and just doing a sacrament. But we're actually existing in that reconciliation. And when we partake, we're proclaiming this is what Christ has done. Well, so, guys, whoever, you know, time to pass the cup and the bread around. <laughs>